Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest today has written stories all their life. Before becoming a full-time author, they had a 30-year career in non-commercial broadcasting, most recently as program director of the community radio station in Portland, Maine. Besides Maine, they had homes in New Mexico, the L.A. area, Seattle, the Florida Panhandle, and New Hampshire. For four years, they served in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. They loved chess, birding, choral singing, and playing the bass. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Lisa Bunker. Hi, Julia. It's a pleasure to be here. Lisa, our opening question on Authors Over 50 is always, what took so long to write a first book? Um, It didn't take me 50 years to write a first book. It took me 50 years to publish a first book, Um, a key distinction. Um, I've been writing all my life. Um, I started as a child um, doing, you know, imitations of the authors that I enjoyed. Um, And by high school, I was plotting out whole novels and writing stories. Um, I've tried my hand at plays, at poetry, at all kinds of things. I've always just felt the urge or uh there's a word even stronger than urge i have i have felt the imperative to express myself in language and i am i am eternally fascinated by the pure challenge of a blank screen and a blinking cursor and you have a language now make something beautiful that will communicate with other people that's just that's just endlessly fascinating to me Um, So I've been writing all my life, and um, I pursued publication in a bunch of different ways without success for many years. It was when I was in my mid-50s, about five years ago, that I finally um, got a lucky break um, and got my manuscript in front of the right pair of eyes, and an editor at Viking picked up my first published novel, Felix Is, Is is spelled Y-Z, and acquired my second novel, and then halfway through that novel, um, he left to go back to business school. Um, And that was the beginning of the end of my brief sojourn in mainstream publishing. Uh, One person, one person got me in. When that person left, I was not able to sell a third project to people. Although in recent times, um, I've been sought out to create a few projects for that sector of the publishing industry. So having gotten a few books published, I've created a little bit of a presence. And when there was, uh, there was they were looking for somebody to write a book about a trans teenager in Texas. Um, and they were looking for some uh, an out transgender author of uh, books for young readers with significant political experience. And I am that person. That's me. Um, so I got work because I got those books published. But as far as my own, the, you know, the work of my heart, my own creative endeavors, my most recent book, Almond Courts and Finch, um, came out with. Uh, just a few just a few weeks ago, um, as of this recording in November 2023, um, with a micro publisher in Sacramento, California, where I live now, um, and I've had a wonderful time working with them, New Wind Publishing. Um, so that's that was more than you asked, but that's a brief history of my publishing career to date. Well, as authors, we have so many options these days. You you landed in mainstream publishing, traditional publishing right off the bat. And that's what a lot of authors long for. Um, but we can go with small presses and in self-published these days. And, and it's all a wonderful 
a wonderful way to publish. My feeling has been that I have just as much chance having success with a book published by a micro publisher where I'm their only project and they're giving their full attention to the whole publication process as I do being one of hundreds of books being churned out by a major publisher with an overworked, harried editor um, and copy editor and no promotions budget. Um, it's, I think I think it's as viable a path to success as a writer um, as as mainstream publishing. And those mainstream publishers are now requiring their authors to do as much as self-published authors. We have to handle our our own publicity most of all, which is is a big a big elephant in the room for most authors because we we love to write. We don't like to promote ourselves. Yes, or it's just very difficult. Um, I've tried without success to build a following on various social media platforms. I don't have a knack for it. I'm not a natural when it comes to um, Instagram or Blue Sky or whatever. Um, so, you know, I've gotten frustrated with this, with the uh, self-promotion part. Um, I like this sort of thing. I like writing a, a guest blog post or having a chat with a podcast interviewer. Um, I, I, I crave human connection. I just... I, I love writing and I love stories and I want to share my geeky glee with other people just by talking about it like we are now or by writing good stories um, and and having people read them um, and benefit from them. Uh, so I just keep looking for the connection that has a zap, you know, that actually works. Um, it's It's a long, sometimes frustrating and discouraging process, but here we are still in the game. It really is frustrating, and and I agree. I I love our writing community. We have such generous people, and 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 we all want to pay it forward. That's how this podcast began. Is is that I felt so encouraged by my immediate community that I said, "Well, I'll I'll do a few podcasts." They say the podcast fade comes after your twelfth podcast, and here I am at one hundred and ninety nine because I. Fantastic. I I love celebrating all of you authors who have uh, achieved so much. You know, we we hear about people winning awards for over 30 or over 40 or under 30 or under 40, but we don't hear many about over 50. So I'm really excited to celebrate this community. Um, another aspect of getting started so late for me was um, was my gender journey, as I sometimes describe it. Um, I was born male-bodied and lived as a boy and man for 45 years. And um, my frustration with that role, my my sort of my deep mismatch with masculinity um, took a long time to surface. Um, but I did eventually come out and go through gender transition and live for 15 years as a transgender woman before taking another step just recently um, and claiming non-binary gender identity. But um, in those early years, in those early decades, uh, my ambitions as a writer were all tangled up in my unexpressed gender business. And um, that was a lot of weight to put on um, an endeavor, which I think at its best is a form of play. I think we do our best work as writers when we are just joyfully creating in a free space without expectation of future success, without any reference to past trauma. I mean, that, that can inform a story, but I think we do our best work when we are playing with language. And I was not able to play as an unexpressed trans person because I had this great weight of this expectation to perform my gender in a certain way that felt foreign and difficult and hard for me. Um, and my ambitions as a writer were wrapped up in that. So I was, you know, sort of resentfully mumbling, I'll show you all someday, you know, and I just, I wasn't creating good work. Um, it was, it was fraught. It was weighted down with, with my own particular baggages. Um, it is no accident that I began to succeed, succeed as a writer when I came out and went through transition, because then I was free to create my best stories, to just find what I loved and try to make something beautiful um, without trying to work through my personal stuff. Well, I think you you certainly uh, show that journey in your work. 
I think for me, story comes from the same place in my brain that played let's pretend when I was five and my my siblings and cousins, we would get together and we would be magical creatures in a fantastic land or something. Um, I remember I was a black panther with wings once and I was so pleased with what I was pretending. Um, and I suppose maybe that part of our brain just sort of gets shunted aside for many people as we approach adulthood, but I never stopped pretending. Um, and um, so that's where it comes from for me. Um, when it comes to creating characters, um, I do shamelessly borrow from among my acquaintance um, for the people that I put in my books. Um, my second novel, Zenobia July, is about a transgender girl um, moving to, losing her, her origin family, which who were not supportive, and moving to live with her lesbian aunts in Portland, Maine, um, and going to school in stealth, as we say, which means nobody knows that she's trans. Um, and the aunts are two friends of mine. I, I, I wanted to have family of choice for a young trans girl in a new town. And I thought of them and I went and asked them, I said, can I make fictionalized versions of you um, in a story? And one of them was like, ah, I don't know, but the other one talked her into it. Um, and so I was just able to sort of think what would it be like um, if a childlike version of me ended up living with them and trying to make her way through the world. Um, so I don't mind borrowing from real life, um, but I'm also, I, I also enjoy pure invention. I also enjoy just making somebody up out of whole cloth. Um, and I'm sure that other writers um, have experienced what I have experienced, which is that once you've worked with them for a while, your characters come to life in your head. They become independent entities um, and start talking and acting on their own, um, which is fascinating. It can get a little bit complicated if they're, you know, resisting where you thought the story was going to go. Um, and they start doing things on their own and taking things in unexpected directions. And it's a fascinating puzzle. Research, um, I've, I've had to do, for a couple projects um, that I've done, I had to do actual research because I wrote one book, which is about a, a real life person. Um, and I wrote another book based on the life of a real person. So, you know, that's just due diligence. That's talking to the people on trying to get multiple sources and understand the milieu um, the setting and the personalities, and then being true to that. I think our characters really do take on lives of their own, and they live in our heads, and they do start talking to us. And and sometimes I, I believe that they're real life um, people in my life. You know, sometimes I wake up and and wonder what they're going to do next. They really do take over our imaginations. That's right. Um, and it's like the, the characters of the stories that I love the most are also as real to me as real people in the world. You know, the inhabitants of Middle Earth um, are as real to me or um, the characters in the movie, in the, the show The Wire or um, or in um, The West Wing, which my spouse and I are watching again. You know, C.J. Craig is a friend of mine. I, I know her as well as I know most of the real people that I know. Um, and if it, I love the idea that I'm creating characters and stories that might be that for somebody else. That feels like a really deep and interesting form of human connection. I dream so vividly at night that I wake up the next morning and I think that it actually happened and it stays with me throughout the day. So I think that's all part of those imaginations that writers have. It's bubbling all the time. The, the story spring. Um, the 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 what if engine and the character generator um, and the 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 language machine that sort of thinks of interesting ways to describe things that we see and feel and experience in the world. Um, I think writing, as much as anything, is a series of mental habits, um, and those of us who are you know our brains are built that way. Um, it's just happening all the time, um, and then we have the choice of whether to point that at a screen or a page and try to make a thing. Um, there's a lot of, it takes a lot of work to write a book. Um, it's, it's a significant undertaking. Um, it's hard um, and there's no guarantee of success. There's no guarantee of return on all your investment of time and energy. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's a choice whether you're going to point those tools that are happening in your brain at work or not. Serving in politics must have been great fodder for the imagination. How was that experience? 
Um, so I served four years as a state representative in New Hampshire. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing to do. Um, huge legislature for a tiny state. There are 400 seats in that chamber, um, which is one of the, this is the largest state legislature. Um, and by the numbers, I represented only about 3,500 people. Um, so it wasn't like being a state rep here in California, where you have to have a professional staff and raise millions of dollars and buy television advertising. I raised a few thousand dollars by emailing my friends and acquaintances and had some signs made and some flyers printed and knocked on a bunch of doors and got myself elected. Um, once I was in the legislature, um, it was fascinating people watching. Um, I think we do. I'm, I'm a, a liberal lefty Democrat sort of person. Um, but I, and I live in a, you know, I live in my bubble, as I think most people do. Um, and um, I have friends who are politically like me and I go to church with people who are politically like me. Uh, but that job put me in close quarters and working on complicated projects together with um, conservative Republicans. Um, and I, I got to observe firsthand the full spectrum of our political landscape now. Um, and I witnessed the polarization, but I also observed that most of my colleagues were uncomfortable with it um, all across the, the spectrum. There were there were some very there were some people who were into the sort of the, the, the weaponized separation um, and the sort of moving as far apart from each other as possible and then engaging in what amounted to warfare. Um, but there was a whole bunch of people in the middle who were maybe being quiet and, and not, figured, not able to express themselves but who didn't want to be at war and who wanted to try to find common ground. Um, for the purposes of writing, I, I was like casting central for secondary characters for the rest of my life, especially grumpy grandpas. I, I got my fill of grumpy grandpas. That's just fascinating to me. Uh, more power to you for doing that. I don't think I could deal with the legislative life. I, I turned out to be too much of an introvert to be an effective politician. Um, I did fine, you know, I served ably, uh, but I didn't stay because I was, I saw what it took to be really effective in that realm. And I didn't have what it took. I wasn't enough of a schmoozer, a people person. Um, I felt overwhelmed almost as soon as I entered the building. So I am more of a writer than a, an elected official. I think I like my space, my, my, I like my alone time. Well, you could certainly write speeches for those who give them because we need that as well. And there's an art to that. I'm, I'm watching the West Wing now, as I mentioned. So, yes, I'm, speech writing is in my head. Did writing your first book change your process of writing? Um. I, I tried the, the book, the, the book that I have that was the first that finally got published, I wrote in a new way. And I think that had something to do with its success. Um, I wrote my first book as a NaNoWriMo project, National Novel Writing Month, which is the month of November each year. Uh, the basic challenge of NaNoWriMo is to write 50,000 words in 30 days. Um, my, my problem uh, was back in the old days, I was a perfectionist. And instead of just blurting out a rough draft, I would get stuck on trying to, you know, endless, tink endless tinkering with the first paragraph or the first chapter. Um, I needed something to get me to just finish a story in whatever sloppy, garbagey form it had to be in order to simply be done and then to learn how to revise and to go back and discard whole chapters and characters and plot lines and refine and refine and finally come up with the kind of story that I love to read and I like to and I love to write, which is tight and clean. I love a story where nothing is wasted, where all the parts mesh beautifully, like like a watch, like an old fashioned, beautiful mechanical watch with little rubies in it. Um, that's the kind of story that I like to read and write. I tried NaNoWriMo as well, and I was an English major, and I would try to edit as I went along and quickly discovered that was not going to get me to my goals. So I was like you. I had to just get those words down on paper and and just forget about editing as I went along and, and get to the end. But it certainly encouraged me to write more quickly. And then you have a thing you have you have this you know roughed out 
sort of form, which has, which has all the things in it that it needs, or at least the beginnings of all the things that you need to have a finished book. It's, it's really necessary. The other thing that I, that I find absolutely necessary is I love a good edit. Um, I, I, now that's, there are bad edits in the world. There are bad editors, um, mostly people who want to take over and do it their own way. Um, but a good editor is, um, a, a sophisticated and aware and generous reader who engages fully with your work and then says in a really straightforward, supportive, but honest way, here's what's working for me here. Here's what I don't understand. Here's what seemed off. Um, I didn't understand, you know, I, I, I want more of this. I'm really interested in this. Um, and I'm sure you've talked to other writers who have, who struggle with finding that sweet spot between insisting on, you know, your own inspiration, your own ideas and bending to the wills of others. I mean, if you're going to be published, you have to respond to that. Um, but what I learned was um, that made the work better. In fact, in, in most of my books, there's at least one chapter which I hadn't thought of on my own. And somebody, an agent or an editor said, you know, I'd love to hear more about X. And my response was still, you know, how dare you impugn the perfection of my genius? But then um, I would think about it and and say, all right, I'll try. And I would write a chapter, which turned out to be my favorite chapter. So um, it really, it really is important to learn to take critique and to and to um navigate the challenge of figuring out when to insist on your own concept and when to um, accept guidance from others. Um, I don't have a pat answer to that. It's a new puzzle each time, but it's important to engage with it. That's so true. And I, I do love uh, really talented editors. I also love a good writing retreat where you can read a passage and you have other writers who want to give their opinion. And And I had in my first book, three protagonists. And I thought the main protagonist was one woman. And they told me, absolutely not. Your main protagonist is this other, you know, character. So, you know, the writers and editors can help us figure out a lot as we go along the way and, and make our work stronger. And writing and reading are a collaboration. I mean, we, we spend all this time as authors creating this, this artifact in text and then we send it out into the world and a reader engages with it and they create something in their mind, which is half what we did and half their life and experience and understanding. Um, and I love that it's different with each reader. Um, that's a fascinating thing to me. Um, so yes, we, we do the work up, up front and then they come and read and that's a form of work too. And this marvelous kind of deep communication at its best is happening. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage you've brought to share today and then read so that we can hear your tone and voice in the book. Um, so I'm going to read you the first short chapter of Almond Courts and Finch, which is my new novel that just came out from New Wind Publishing in Sacramento. Um, the story of this novel is um, it's a fantasy in that it takes place in a long ago faraway land, um, but there's no magic or dragons um, there's there's no sort of epic battle. Um, once we're in our imaginary land, everything that happens is real human story on a human scale. Um, there's palace intrigue, family drama, cultural strife, um, and there's a gendery aspect to um, this book. One of the one of the sort of form formative moments for this book was beginning to wonder what would it be like if there was a culture where children were raised without gender. And at a certain age, we got to choose the gender they were going to live as, including a non-binary option, and to choose their adult names. So just give you a taste of this. So I'll read you chapter one. Long ago, in the forgotten land of Irzam, a parched and sweltering fiefdom, refugees from another forgotten land, the northern realm of Nezel, labored as little more than slaves. They had fled their homeland after zealots from among their countrymen had overthrown and murdered their leader, Meb Natal, visionary founder of The Way. Following reports that trickled back from the first few to leave, family after family headed south in search of even the least sense of safety and hope. 
This was how, in time, a dozen dozen or so Nezel immigrants found themselves toiling as servants in a dusty little castle in an arid wasteland under the rule of a people who did not look, act, speak, believe, or worship as they did. On a certain summer morning through the furnace air came young Nemtori, flitting like a trick of the eye along the base of the fortress wall. In the Nezel tongue, Nemtori means almond. Such were the child names Nezel parents who followed the way gave their children. Simple words from daily life providing no hint of girl or boy. Almond's feet made no sound on the hot earth and the homespun breech clout and tunic all Nezel youth wear until their namings flapped around the servant's slight frame. Still, one watching would not say, here is a frail creature. Wire bent by an alert and agile mind danced under that thin wool. Eyes, deep in watchfulness, sparked in that thin face. I think I'll stop there. A chapter, the whole chapter is a lot, but that's a sample of the, of the tone I was going for. Um, I wanted to do something elevated, poetic. Um, I was inspired in particular by the Earth Sea trilogy by Ursula K. Le Guin, which I absolutely loved as a child and still read every couple of years. Um, so yeah, I was going going for a sort of golden age of fantasy literary feel, lots of five senses um, language, um, lots of interesting vocabulary. Well, you achieved that. That's that's lovely. Your descriptions are are just beautiful. Thank you. You suck us right in. You want us to hear more. <laughs> I do. I want you to. I want. It's, it's so frustrating to spend five years making a book and then splashing it out into the world and having five people show up at your bookstore event. Um, people are wary. I mean, there's just so many people who are like, pay attention to my thing. Um, so it's, it's, it's this, and it's, I used to be hung up on fame. I'm not anymore. I don't care if I get famous as a writer. I just want to connect. I love what I'm doing. This is the most, this book is the most beautiful thing I know how to make in the world. And I want to show it to you. <laughs> I want to share it with people. Um, and they're like, oh, you wrote a book, huh? Cool. And their eyes shift away um, because they don't know. Um, but I, I guess I have to keep doing it because I just, I, we're more to the point. I'm, I, I have, I have abilities in other areas. I'm, I write music too. I compose crossword puzzles. You know, I, I have, I have a creative brain. I can, I can, potentially make an interesting thing in lots of forms. And here I am in my third, third, you know, and time is precious. And I'm just trying to find out how to connect to people. Where's the thing that I can do? What can I make that will have the zap of real connection that people will really engage with? And maybe my next project isn't a book. Maybe it's a YouTube channel or, I don't know, a live performance or something. Um, I just... I, I have all of this energy and creativity and I just want to connect with other humans and share my joy, share the joy of creation, share the joy of story. And I feel a sense of mission too. I mean, most all, all of my books so far have a lot of LGBTQ characters in them. And there's a, an enormous amount of misunderstanding, especially about trans and non-binary people right now in the world. We're being used as a political punching bag and the, the sort of the propaganda machine of the far right is inventing all these horrible stories about us. And that needs to be answered. That need, I, somebody, people need to stand up to that. And I am in a, I'm fortunate. I'm in a position of, you know, privilege and safety myself. I'm in a position of privilege and safety myself that I can, um, I, I'm, I'm empowered to be one of the people speaking up for the non the gender non-conforming folks who are all around us in the world um, and telling real stories to counteract the fake, horrible, you know, fear mongering stories. Um, so I feel that sense of mission too, but mostly I just want to connect. I want to share my joy. I, that's no different than any of us. You know, I think we're all so dismayed by the fact that there are 2 million titles a year released in the U.S. And it's overwhelming. You know, how do we stick our hand up and say, will you read my book? You know, will you hear my message? And I think that's, you know, our greatest challenge is to try to get our, our words out there. And, and when we do hear from a reader who has found our book, 
however they do, whether it's in a library or a bookstore or online. And they say, I loved your book and it changed my life. You know, that just means the world to us. That's I I try to remember what you just said, especially for me. um, Books were my lifeline when I was a child. Um, I didn't have um, I didn't have any books to find that were actually about kids like me, unexpressed transgender people. But there were books that were close enough in their story that I could take comfort from them, including the Earthsea books, for example, by Ursula Le Guin. Um, Now I get to write stories about trans kids or non-binary kids and have them be in the world. And what I remember when I get discouraged um, is that these books are making their way into libraries and bookstores. And somewhere, someday, a child who needs them is going to find one. Somebody who needs to know that it's okay that they exist, that there are other people like them is going to find my story and take comfort and strength from it. And that by itself is enough reason to do it. Um, that's, that's, I, that's that's writing success for you. That's your personal writing success right there. Yeah. And I don't necessarily ever get to find out that it happened. I have to take it on faith. But it certainly happened with me. Um, I, among the books I loved when I was a child is um, one called Tosh and the Jesters by an author named Ellen K- McKinsey. Um, and she has fewer she has fewer reviews on Goodreads than I do. You know, I mean, I loved all of the sort of the the big books of my era, the Narnia books and Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and um, Watership Down, which are big books that everybody knows. But there were other books that mattered just as much to me that are like my books. They're books that nobody else has ever heard of. So you get them out there, people find them, and that's the work. Well, Lisa, as always, our last interview question is, our writers over 50 are quite a unique group. Do you have any advice for writers 50 and above? Um, I'm going to tell you what I'm telling myself, which is um, time is precious. Try to use all of it um, in a thoughtful, intentional way. Um Don't be intimidated by um, the rise of new media. Um, Engage if you can, but it's still totally fine to be making a book out of paper with print on a page. um, And the internet is not necessary. It's useful, but it's not necessary. That's wise advice for those of us who struggle with social media every single day and have to get sometimes our grandchildren to be able to teach us how to to use it because they've grown up with screens in their hands from you know the age of toddlers so we appreciate your being with us here today i think you have definitely found your mission in life and you're speaking your truth and and that's always something that all of us need to do so thank you for being here and sharing your lovely new book with us and we look forward to more projects from you in the future and we're excited to now say that you're counted among our authors over 50. Thank you it's been really fun talking to you. Thank you for joining us today please look for authors over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third.